scrub hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. Mm, no need for pesticides to poison all our soil. We've got no food, they got no clothes, they got no rent. When right now, it's time to hell. Thank you for taking time for hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Roku TV. Good golly, Miss Molly, if they can find a spot on the internet to play music, you will find us there. And we, of course, are the only all-cannabis, all-the-time, 24-hour broadcast on i. Heart Radio. You can also tune in to Roku TV and find the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network on Roku TV and also share us with your friends. It is Tuesday and on Tuesday we'd like to pay a big salute to all the hardworking activists up in Canada and my joint host on Tuesdays is KDK distributor Kelly Kristen. Good morning Kelly. Good morning, Casper. How you doing today? Fine. I tell you, I am envious of all the people living in Canada to have such a fine government and an amazing leader to make marijuana recreational use especially available to all of its citizens. I can only imagine that people are running around now in the streets with flowers in their hair, singing songs like they used to be hippies from a long time ago. And holding hands with the police singing Kumbaya. Is that right? <laughs> well, we'd have to say that's a little extreme because uh, it hasn't happened yet. But uh, it's in the works. And it's one of the the uh, 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 first things that the government's going to do since they got in power. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, look forward. There's, there's some stuff coming up very soon, um, I, you know, about what they're going to do to um, uh, regulate it and uh, tax it and how they're going to distribute it and who's going to supply it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions and, um, and the government is working diligently, we assume, to uh, move forward with this, with uh, the legalization, regulation and legalization uh, and sale and distribution of cannabis in our wonderful country. Well, and you know, there are a few people up in Canada who are going to miss the old laws. Uh, people like, well, Mark Amory and uh, our guest today, Chris Goodwin, who sometimes, I don't know, I may be wrong, I, I think consider it to be like a hobby to get arrested for uh, being involved with marijuana. I don't know. Yes, our guest, you mentioned Chris Goodwin. He's our our. Our guest today on the show, and uh, uh, he's been pretty active in the, the Canadian scene for a very long time. Are you there, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, uh, Casper and Kelly. Time for him. It's a good afternoon in Toronto. Hi, Chris. Did I get that right? Is you going to jail one of your hobbies in life? <laughs> <laughs> it seems that way. That civil disobedience has been one of my uh, big hobbies in life, for sure. Bet you bet. Yeah, I've uh, I go back a long ways with uh, Chris. Uh, he was around. He was already in business uh, when I up and started KDK about 15 years ago. So I've known him for a long time uh, since uh, he started. Uh, I used to run a head shop in Hamilton, Ontario. I guess let's let's start there. We get a little bit of background on you, Chris. Let's uh, take you all the way back to Hamilton and where we we first met you and and, and some of the you know throwing a little bit of uh, we can't fit it all in in the in the in the hour. So, but give us a little bit of history about your activism and your involvement in the cannabis uh, legalization, uh, you know, uh, campaign that we've, we've waged most of our lives? Well, I guess for me, it started in the late, mid to late 90s. A friend gave me the book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrera, and it basically changed my life. I was shocked at the U.S. example of the war on drugs, and, and I became almost like a hemp activist. And for the next few years, I started preaching through high school in the early college years about, uh, about hemp and activism and, and that kind of thing. And I, I, I did a big conference called the Hemp Awareness Seminar where I got Rosie Robotham to speak and a city councillor. And it was my, some of my first entrance into politics where an MPP showed up, Chris Charlton from the NDP in Hamilton. And I eventually joined the NDP. But um, 
I was then arrested uh, soon after being an adult. My, my mother found some oil uh, in my bedroom and called the police. And I spent the night in jail for that. And so did my girlfriend at the time, who became my wife. And uh, it changed my life as well. I, I, I started reaching out for ways in which I could fight this differently. And Mark approached me, Mark Emery in Vancouver, and said that I should uh, change from being a hemp environmentalist to a civil disobedient activist and openly and transparently break the law. And if I wanted to get news media and coverage and, and wanted to affect social change, civil disobedience was the way to go. And, and it's worked out well for me. <laughs> worked out well? Um, well, obviously you've been involved in the industry uh, since that time. Um, you've, you've been in and out of jail a couple of times, uh, trying to, uh, be that activist. And, uh, you know, so you've, you've definitely had, uh, some trials and tribulations over the years. Is there anything that stands out as, as, uh, you know, nothing seemed to break you. Um, I don't think they're going to break you now for sure. Um, Yeah. Lots of fun. Well, the things that stand out, I guess I would say, would be that early on, I started doing some of the first four twenties in Southern Ontario and Hamilton, Niagara Falls, and other cities. And it was at a time when people were saying, you can't do this. It, it, it's impossible. They're going to stop it and shut it down. And we did it anyways. And a bunch of me and my friends got arrested in the first couple. And But we just kept doing them year after year until they started getting bigger and more accepted. Like A, a lot of our goals are normalization and removing the stigma on the cannabis culture. So some of those original protests did that. They, they gave us the opportunity as a culture to gather and assemble and be at peace with and, and but openly break the law in a way that, that you couldn't do alone. There's power in numbers. And eventually along the way, I started telling my friends and family that I wanted to do this every day as a business. And again, they said the same thing. You can't do this. You know, they're letting you get away with it on one day a year, you can't do this every day. And I opened up my first cannabis cafe in, in early 2000s, and it got raided in the first five days. And my landlord wouldn't let me reopen. And after a year of court and then another year of probation, I opened the Up and Smoke Cafe in, in uh, 2003. So, um, and that place stayed open two and a half years and, and had a lot of police visits and three police raids and many arrests, and I was sentenced to six months at the end of it, and within a week of getting out, I opened Vapor Central in Toronto, and that place has been operating almost 10 years successfully now, and it's one of the biggest vapor lounges in Ontario, and uh, it, it helped, you know, start a movement. It, it, not as big as the dispensary explosion in Canada, but uh, there's been about 50 to 100 vapor lounges opened in the last 10 years, and I, I consulted on, on many of them, and I've been happy to say I was a part of helping a lot of those open. So, uh, you know, we have gotten to a point where, uh, although we're not completely tolerated in what we do, they are, they are accepting it. So um, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm bringing, you know, every time something that li- like that happens, of course, it's in the public eye. And the public sees it more, and I, I think the vapor lounge idea. Um, I know up until um, I guess pro, you know they're they're they have run successfully, peacefully, and us. Uh, you know, I, I, as you know, I would had was part of owner of a vapor lounge out in your area for a short period of time, and when we opened. Um, some of the initial reactions were very detrimental. Some of the people were not very happy. Some of the local residents, some of them were happy that we were there. And some people, of course, were sort of on the fence. Shortly after we opened, we actually cleaned up the area um, from some of the hardcore hard drug use that was happening in the area. They liked to use the telephone that was right outside the door, public telephone of the lounge. And uh, with all the activity happening in the lounge, they just moved away. Uh, so it actually, you know, uh, cleaned up some of the uh, some of the very hard drug use in the area. It brought new business uh, directly to our neighbor. He absolutely loved us because he was a convenience store, and uh, his business uh, doubled or tripled after we opened. Uh, all the restaurants, 
lo- local restaurants in the area loved us because their business also increased. So we we just naturally uh, helped clean up the area and and brought and revitalize it to uh, bring a lot of new business to the area. So we, we, they had a meeting at one time. They called the city, called us. They had said they were going to stop issuing any new licenses for vapor lounges, and they wanted to have a discussion on it. So I actually flew out to Toronto, and uh, we went to um, downtown to the city hall, I guess, or whatever you call it, and um, spoke with a couple individuals, our representatives of the city, and you know, just. I, I so I took it upon myself to go to some of the local neighbors, business neighbors, and ask them, you know, if there was anything that they were, you know, concerned about or didn't like or anything like that. I was actually hoping to get some kind of negative feedback because I assumed there was had to be some area we needed to improve. But in all honesty, uh, every the, the fifteen neighboring businesses and not all of them of course were restaurants or or uh, uh convenience stores and they liked us because we increased their business a lot of the stores said hey you know since you guys open we don't have people i don't go out my back door and there's someone smoking in the back alley and that kind of stuff or smoking in the park yeah. that's close by all of a sudden they had a facility to go and use and and they made use of it so every single one of the 15 neighbors i interviewed that Day had nothing but positive to things to say about the vapor lounge, and, and so, that's exciting to hear. And that's usually a very common thing across the country. And these lounges are opening in communities all over Ontario and Canada, and they're getting very similar reactions. And when we opened on, the, we opened Goodweeds recently, which is our latest thing. That, that was actually the first reaction before any of the, the fallout, which is that uh, you know the neighbors came in and were so happy that it wasn't because we took over an old bar space that used to have syrup alcohol and. Uh, and they were so glad that the, there was none of that anymore. And it used to run as an after hours and, and that we weren't going to operate that way. And that, you know, the cannabis community is a lot more peaceful than, than people who are drunk. So, um, and, and we're on a block now with an, a compassion club that's been here 10 years, section 56. And one of the pizzerias in the neighborhood does medical marijuana cooking classes once a month. And so we, we felt the community was actually beneficial to, you know, Right. So, um, so there you are, you're in Hamilton and then, uh, you come to, you went, went, went to Toronto and opened up the vapor central. And, uh, I right. guess now the the next step from there, you, uh, opened up another facility in, in, uh, in, uh, or late last year. Yeah. So the vapor lounge concept with, you know, uh, we have been pretty successful in doing like stand up comedy shows, you know, themed in front of a, a stoned audience and doing podcasts with like Matt Myrna and other people. And so we're continuing that trend as well. Entertainment based, a lounge with comfortable couches. And, um, but, uh, and, and you know, the, the volcanoes on every table and bong rentals and now dabs are popular. So a lot of people rent rigs and torches or emails, but we thought the natural evolution of a vapor lounge was, was serving, was dispensing. And, and because of my experience in cannabis cafes and vapor lounges and Don Breer and Carol Gwilt's experience in dispensary, they have 28 across Canada, uh, the chain weeds, glass and gifts. And, uh, you know, we just thought it was a good marriage, uh, bringing weeds and the vapor lounge together and opening good weeds lounge. And um, we went on Vice and announced that we were going to sell dabs to anybody 18 plus, as well as bong hits and vapor bags of uh, a dozen different strains of weed. And we had all sorts of different shatters and oils and resins. And and uh, and we did it for about a month. Right. Now, what you were selling, did the people have to consume it on in your, you know, the idea you've gone to the bar, so you order a drink, you drink it there? Or are you also selling for people to take away from the store? No, the lounge itself was strictly like the bar example. So... You know, a waitress at a bar would be very upset if you tried, you know, putting a beer in your pocket and taking it out. Uh, we would have uh, felt the same way with a paper bag or, you know, with a bong or something like that. So, yeah, so when we fill a bong head, a vapor bag, a dab, you, you consume it on site. But because we're part of the weed dispensary chain, uh, and there's six in Toronto already, you know, you can easily just go down the street to the retail store weed and, and purchase the marijuana that you wanted to take with you or the hash or the oil. 
Right, right. Now, was there, so there's no, like a, a standard vapor lounge, was there any uh, entrance fee or you just paid obviously for what you consumed, like going to a bar and ordering drinks? No, it is It is like the vapor lounge. So outside of just the dab bar idea, selling dabs and selling vapor bags and balling it, we are like vapor central and a vapor lounge. It's $5 at the door. People have monthly and yearly memberships. Um, you know, comedy events and, and bands and podcasts would be an extra event fee. Uh, so everything people have come to expect from a lot of the vapor lands in Toronto or Canada, we operated very similarly. So, uh, right. so the only go anywhere being, else. Right. The only difference being very similar to every other vapor lounge, um, just that you're now offering dab hits for sale at the counter, so to speak. Right. Excellent. Well, I, I, you know, obviously it is the natural progression from the vapor lounge to actually serving uh, customers. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I suspect that that's what's going to be happening sometime in the near future. Um, anyhow, um, something along that lines. So obviously, if it becomes legal and regulated, they're going to have to have somewhere to consume it. Mm-hmm. But in the future, like the beer store, you know, your bars, even as, as mom and pa's bars are, even if the, the whole industry above that is corporatized, like you have to buy it at the beer store and liquor store. You know, bars have to buy their product from the beer store and liquor store. It's not like they can just uh, buy it off the street either. So vapor lines in the future will probably have to buy from the, the regulatory body in each province if they're even allowed to exist at all, which that's one of the reasons we are pushing for this, right? Like, Colorado and Washington and other examples, uh, even though they legalized the retail sales, they had no uh, public consumption, right? There's, uh, unlike our, you know, a lot of people smoke marijuana walking on the street in, in major cities in Canada, as well as our 420 GMM, we have major public consumption already. And, and with people around in cannabis cafes being allowed to survive the last 10 years, it, it just seemed like we did not want to move forward with legalization without us pushing this model that that vapor lounges, dispensing, single serving is something that the that the liberals should consider before coming out with their, their, their final recommendation or law. So we want to be included in the legalization model. We just don't want it to be uh, buy a quarter at the at the cannabis store and take it home and consume it in your own home. Uh, we believe that there's a, a social benefit to cannabis community gathering together. So Oh, there's definitely a social aspect to it, as you know. It's uh, um, <coughs> as much or anything else on this planet brings people together and like minds and uh, who people who uh, also don't necessarily uh, enjoy to partake themselves, but certainly like to participate in the uh, in the group. Uh, you know, consuming cannabis is is really. You know, let's face it, for guys like you and me, really, it's the norm. You know, it's it's yeah. already the norm. It's not, you know, it's something that should have been the norm before we were born. But, um, um, you know, that isn't the case. And, uh, you know, thank goodness for people like yourselves and um, so many of the other activists in the country and, and the United States and around the world that have continued to push and fight and, you know, get a little crack open in the door and then open up that crack a little further and keep opening it until until it becomes the norm and uh yeah like i say for for guys like us it it is the norm already and it has been in my in in my adult life it has always been the norm (laughs) and what is also the norm for us here at time for hemp is to pay our bills so far we have normally been able to do that and in order to make that happen we have to stop and pay our bills here on the air by taking a commercial break. And then we're going to listen to a song about how fantastic marijuana is. And then we're going to come back and pick up and chat for a whole lot more on Time for Hemp. Earth can't 
Time for the Global Broadcasting Network. The only broadcasting network dedicated to ending the global war on drugs on iHeartRadio. Physicians Clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastrointestinal disorder such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. At Crop King Seeds, we sell the finest marijuana seeds in the world. Grown organically with original genetics, every seed is cultivated for large yields, high THC content, and measured for both CBD and CBN levels. Did we mention we sell more than 20 of the world's best marijuana strains in feminized, auto-flowering, medical, and regular varieties, including White Widow, Blueberry, Purple Kush, Haze Extreme, and so many more. Through our website and friendly call support team, our seeds are available for direct order with speedy worldwide shipping. Crop King, seeds Crop King seeds are also sold in over 100 locations worldwide. Excuse me, I'm looking to buy some Crop King seeds. Look no further, my friend. <laughs> wow, they're here and in so many strains. Buy your seeds now, in store or online at CropKingSeeds.com or call us toll free at 1 844 Crop King. That's 1 844 276 7546. Sometimes you just need to take time to watch the grass grow. That's why the Time for Hemp Broadcasting Network is growing multiple cannabis gardens for you to enjoy 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, streaming live in high definition. Watch our gardens to learn how to grow yours. Visit timeforhemp.com right now. The Time for Hemp Broadcasting Network, where we don't just talk about growing cannabis, we do it. How would you like to have all the best cannabis info all in one place? Canifo.com is the Google, Facebook, and Craigslist of cannabis. It even has its own social media platform. Canifo.com puts the world of medicinal and recreational cannabis in one place for consumers, businesses, and growers. Canifo.com is a free service where you can find over 9,000 different strains of cannabis, shop cannabis classifieds, and much more. Canifo.com is the world's most comprehensive source for all things cannabis. Get in the know with Canifo. And so it was said that the earth he provided for I and I. I and I. They don't want you to know marijuana. I eat soap and be free. Just so let it be. They don't want you to know marijuana. I eat soap and be free. Just so let it be. Herb smoke, keep I sane, take my pain, stop my grain, so much I gain, so I blame. I sane, I might bring the right strain to my brain, to chop lightning like I wane. Come and lay up on the lava, grown, and if them soft, like a guava, them can't come round. This part of town, telling you the tart alone, I could have spot at it, fault alone. Revival, hallelujah, it start up, no reprisal, feel the looja, it water down, I pardon, no. But they're in a me garden strong This is not a marijuana song Cause they don't want you to know marijuana 
I so can be free Just so let it be They don't want you to know marijuana I so can be free Just so let it be This is not marijuana music Just a message from the ones that use it Don't abuse it Has a mind that fertile Bring forth something that worthwhile Know your worth, child Can no officer alive Could I look in my eyes And see what I prophesize My mind is forever occupies Thoughts of all my talk as spies Amongst us A trouble for my trouble me. Then my chalice I go bubble it Drop in a one load then double it How are they in a me God is strong This is not a marijuana song Cause they don't want you to know marijuana I so and be free Just so let it be They don't want you to know marijuana I so and be free Just so let it be Some say, listen up, the truth is to be told Open your eyes, there's beauty to behold What is the new if you consider the old? Why in the world and not consider your soul? What is the cloud if you understand the lining? Who is the king if you consider the lineage? You know it's him, so no continue deny him. Is it freestyle if I consider the line then? Can't figure the timing or just to pick the rhyme scheme. With no trouble to my mind, really, see. But the inner me garden strong. This is not a marijuana song. Cause they don't want you to know marijuana. I so can be free, just so let it be. They don't want you to know marijuana. You sight so can be free, just so let it be. Cause they don't want you to know marijuana. I so can be free, just so let it be. They don't want you to know marijuana I'd so can be free Just so let it be And I let them know That the herb is a lifeline No, they would never want you to know And they would never want you to know So be free No, they would never want you to know Never want you to know. No, 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 no. Never want you to know. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world. Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio. That tune was called This Is Not a Marijuana Song. And this is not a marijuana station. And this is not a marijuana network. We are a cannabis station. We are a hemp network. And we smoke marijuana. Please get your facts straight. It's Tuesday. And on Tuesday, we salute all the amazing people up in Canada for their diligent work on turning this plant back into a cash crop and educating the world around them on how to do so. I cannot believe the ignorance of America standing alongside their brothers and sisters in Canada, border to border, and the Americans are ignorant and and just stumble around in a lost economy, and the Canadians start building a a flourishing hemp industry, turning a, a profit after profit to making food and food and medications and cosmetics, and now even a plane and a car out of this fantastic plant. Kelly, I tell you, you Canadians are so smart and so far ahead of the rest of the pack. I, I, it must be wonderful to live in your country. <laughs> well, I'd like to say first and foremost as a Canadian that, yes, it is a wonderful place in the world to be a resident. There's no question about that, not for um, specifically any reason, but for almost all reasons, for health and welfare and education and all that kind of stuff and opportunity, yeah, it's all here. And now hopefully soon, of course, uh, we will have legalized cannabis. And like the utopia you, you, you speak of going uh, to a facility like Mr. Goodwin opened, where you can uh, basically get a single serving, sit down and have yourself a, 
a dab uh, on your, uh, you know, at the end of the day and uh, put your feet up and relax. Um, hopefully that day is, well, that day is definitely come in Canada. It's going to be sooner than later uh, as opposed to later than sooner with our last government. So uh, we're in a great position right now and, and I'm, I'm loving it. I've always loved being a Canadian and uh, this just makes it that much better, of course. Uh, common sense, as, as all of us know, cannabis is a wonderful product in, in many more ways than just consuming it. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's where the majority of us got our start. And uh, I've been consuming now for, oh, I'm going to say close to 40 years. I guess that's going to date me a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, the plant has been good to me in my whole life. And it continues to provide for me and my family and my friends and, uh, and uh, allows me to meet wonderful people like yourself and Chris and so many others in the industry. Um, I feel blessed, in all honesty, to, uh, to be a part of it all. Well, and, and you've, uh, you've shared your blessings, too. That is one of the wonderful things about you and your amazing team there at KDK. You understand that there are many people out there who uh, are striving to get through life and make it, and they have a lot of medical problems sitting on their plate. And just getting uh, awake and walking down the road sometimes in and of itself is a major task. And uh, you and your team uh, do what you can to make life easier for those so that they can consume medical cannabis in a very healthy way. Don't you, Kelly? You bet. Um, a couple of years ago, or a few years ago now, we started a program where we give away a quality vaporizer for free to a medical patients somewhere in the world. It's uh, or anywhere in the world, uh, wherever you may be listening. Uh, if you use cannabis as a medicine, you're eligible. Um, uh, of course, what we're looking for is people who cannot uh, afford to buy a vaporizer. And as we know, many of the medical patients are on a assisted income, a pension, disability pension, welfare, old age pension, you know, and just about anything where it's difficult to pay rent, uh, buy food, and, uh, and purchase medication, cannabis medication. And, uh, of course, uh, certainly dream to own uh, a vaporizer. People, you know, we're looking for people basically who couldn't afford one on their current income level, but could benefit from the use of a vaporizer. Um, obviously, for them, it's it's kind of uh, two huge benefits. Number one, the obvious health benefit and the reduction of um, carcinogens that are created by combustion or the elimination of carcinogens that are created by combustion. Um, <clears throat> and also, they're much more efficient. So, of course, um, their medicine goes a lot further than previously to owning one. So it really is super help to people who are on a limited income and can't afford a vaporizer. So if you're listening uh, and you are one of these people or you're listening and you're involved in the industry, certainly you know somebody who could use a vaporizer but simply can't afford one. So it's super simple. All you got to do is send me an email to Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at K-D-K Wholesale. Dot ca. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, yeah, we'll put your name in the hat, so to speak, and uh, hopefully we draw you for a free vaporizer. And on behalf of the medical cannabis movement, Kelly, I want to say thank you to you and your team. That is a very loving, very loving thing to do, and uh, and I would encourage those out there to take advantage of this amazing offer. With that said, let's get back to our joint chat with our joint friend here on the Big Joint Broadcast. Don't forget, anytime you hear the word joint on the Big Joint Broadcast, nearly 2.5 million people all around the world pack their bongs or pipes or vaporizers or twist up a joint and take time for hemp. So, Kelly, you and our joint friend can get back to your joint chat while I smoke this joint in the joint on time for hemp. <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of joint, I guess you just got out of the joint, apparently, Chris. And uh, um, I, we sort of touched on the fact that you opened a, just recently opened up a lounge where you were offering single-serve 
uh, dabs for your customers, anybody 18 years of age or older, whether or not you were a medical patient, uh, as long as you were of age and had cash in your pocket, you were welcome at your venue and uh, uh, to come in and partake. Um, this is the utopia that we've I thought about when when I was young, and uh, you know maybe uh, it's it's a little bit fast, I guess, for the government because they seemed or someone somewhere seemed not to like the idea of what you were doing. Uh, maybe you can fill us in as to uh, as to the most recent uh, uh, goings on in your life and uh, in, in the uh, vapor lounge and uh, I guess self serve industry, let's call it. So yeah, like I was saying, that uh, when we opened, uh, we were actually you know pretty welcomed by the community. Uh, community police officer came in in the first week and was very welcoming, and we did that vice story, which uh, went from us uh, being just you know regularly busy to having line up at the door, and and then even another officer came in after having seen the vice story. It was just a beat cop. It wasn't involved in arresting us or anything, and he was pretty happy. He was from the Car- Caribbean and. Grew up with his entire family carrying around marijuana in uh, paper bags, and um, so he, he saw nothing wrong with what we were doing as uh, adults in, in a lounge environment like we were. But uh, two weeks after that, uh, vice and drugs here in Toronto, nothing to do with the beat or any of the, the local divisions or anything, but uh, the vice and drug task force claims they uh, received a complaint, and from that single complaint, they they raided our store and took all the marijuana and dabs and and then charged us with possession for the purpose of trafficking. So uh, my wife and I spent the night in jail and got out on bail the next day and reopened immediately. Two hours after getting out on bail, we were already reopened. And um, we're reopened now strictly as a vapor lounge, but uh, just yesterday, so the last two weeks we've been just a vapor lounge, but just yesterday... Uh, we reopened the dab bar, but uh, for medical patients only. So people that have a, a weed dispensary card or MMPR or any of the other dispensary cards in Toronto. So if you're medical and have a medical card, you can buy dabs at the dab bar. But unfortunately, we had to cease the policy of anybody 18 plus. Right, right, right. So, um, so in a very short period of time, you opened your doors. Um, you started serving up uh, dabs and uh, and bong uh, hits to uh, anybody of age and uh, 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 that wanted to come into your into your uh, business and uh, and then you were on Vice and got lots of publicity and that increased your business double triple whatever uh, obviously like you say right. you know, we almost lined up out the door and then all of a sudden boom arrested, charged, thrown in jail, and then uh, getting bail and opening up two hours later. And now, hence, we right. move forward a couple of weeks. Uh, nothing's transpired uh, as, of the, as of yet, of course. It's way too early in the course of things. No discovery. You don't really know what's going on, how you're going to defend, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, where do you feel you're going to move from here? You're going to maintain. You're going to op- keep your doors open. Um, as you know, previously, we, 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 we know someone who essentially did the same thing in British Columbia a few years ago, <clears throat> and they came back and arrested her again. Are you in fear of that happening again to you as well? Well, like we were discussing off air, that, that story had to do with that they reopened uh, vigorously and, and maintained the same policy, selling to anybody 18 plus. And so... You know, we did uh, temper our policy a little bit and bring it back to, to medical only. And, and we feel that, that that is actually a more appropriate place right now for the political landscape in Toronto. But um, And I'm still not against the idea that uh, we, should, we should push the boundaries for, for legalization and recreational use. But uh, I, I guess our example here on the Danforth just didn't prove that to be, to, to be possible yet. So... Uh, and we were trying for it. We really were um, opening a professional clean, you know, everything done above board. Everybody pays taxes. All of our employees have medical and dental, that kind of thing. One of the things we were actually surprised by is that uh, we were already looking at opening a second location, and uh, the landlord and, and investors that are involved in that are still gung ho about opening a second uh, Good Weeds Lounge. But more than that is that we received more interviews. We were we were doing uh, my wife and I were doing interviews about a week before and we hired some new staff and 
we had already been open a month, so that had died down a bit because it was a month earlier. I posted a sign that we are hiring. But right after the raid, like that afternoon, I received, uh, I heard you were raided and I want to apply for the job. And uh, I received <laughs> two more the next day. And I actually thought that that would scare some people away. That, that, but it, it had the opposite effect. People uh, saw what we were doing and, and, and saw the value and the benefit in, in you know, what we were trying to achieve and wanted to be part of it. So uh, we received a couple uh, you know, new employees because of that and, and we're excited to move forward. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's uh, like you say. You think it would almost have the opposite effect. It would scare any potential uh, employees away, but uh, it actually brought them to you. And that's that's awesome. I'm I'm glad to hear. Goes to show the uh, type of support that is out there uh, from the general average everyday Canadian like you and I. Absolutely. Yeah. No big. So now, so now, uh, basically, all this week, yeah. personally, I've been working on 420. I'm a uh, my wife and I are the lead organizers of 420 Toronto and Young and Dundas Square in uh, basically the, the Times Square of Toronto. It's comparable to New York's Times Square and how it looks and feels. And We've been smoking out that square every year for the last 10 years. This will be our 10th anniversary. And uh, it's a big event now. So it's, it's a $25,000 event with, uh, with booths lining the entire square and 15,000 people show up every year and uh, we have bands and speakers and comedians, and so it's a pretty big event. But uh, just in the last two days, ever since yesterday, I started selling booths uh, for vendors, and we're also looking for sponsors, people that want to have their brand uh, sponsored prominently at 420 and uh, get in touch with us. And, yeah, 420 Toronto is something really big for us. Excellent there. Yeah, we right at the end, we do we can do a little plug for you. We, uh, uh, t you know, you'll have a chance to to plug your uh, plug your venue and also the upcoming event and and how to get a hold of them uh, uh, or how to get a hold of anybody for that kind of stuff and for any of your sponsors that might be out there listening obviously there's an opportunity for you um, again we'll get Chris to provide that information here very shortly um, and, uh, Toronto has probably the biggest marijuana march in the world, apparently. Um, does that translate also into your 420 festivities, do you know? Is it uh, certainly one of the biggest ones? Obviously, it's the biggest city in Canada, uh, but I know they have, you know, as you know, they have great support in Vancouver. Um, it's, it's, it sucks here in Calgary, of course, where we, get, we do get people out, and uh, depending on the weather, it can be as, you know, uh, as little as... Uh, 150 to as much as 600, I guess, if the weather's good. Um, but I know I've, I've been in Vancouver. I've been in Toronto during the march. Um, yeah, these are huge events in your in your city. Um, the size and scope of the 420 event is it uh, right up there on the world stage along with your marijuana march? I don't think so. <clears throat> there are obviously differences. 420 on April the 20th every year, which can land on any day of the week. So. This year, it happens to be on a Wednesday. Uh, so that's all a, a determining factor for attendance and various other things. But Global Marijuana March has always been the first Saturday in May, and some other cities do it on a different Saturday than that. But, uh, but basically, it's the first Saturday in May. So they're different events. And Vancouver, for instance, has the opposite, uh, almost you can almost say problem. Um, their 420, which started in the mid-'90s uh, by Mark Emery, has grown to such massive proportions in Vancouver that it's unmatched anywhere else. They they have over 200 booths, cannabis farmers market, almost all of them selling marijuana right over over their you know tents and tables, and but their global marijuana march is almost non-existent. It's instead of it being you know 20, 30, 40 thousand people like 420 in Vancouver, it's it's sometimes 500 people or 1500 people or you know on a good day. 2,500 or 5,000 people, but um, uh, then, uh, Toronto has the exact opposite, which is that our 420 didn't grow from the 90s in Vancouver, and Global Marijuana March in Toronto was the one that started in the late 90s, and it's grown to be a 40, 50,000 person event in Queen's Park in Toronto, so it is enormous, and um, you know, they do the march through downtown mid-afternoon, like 2 to 4 p.m., and 
So their event is exact opposite ours. 420 is in a in a different civic square, Young and Dundas Square instead of Queens Park. And uh, we get about 15,000 people every year. So um, it's a huge event, but it's nothing like the Global Marijuana March in the sense that uh, that, that event is done in a, in a grass park and, and, it, and it's meant to be just a march that afternoon. And our, our event is more like Toronto, uh, Vancouver Sport 20 Farmers Market, where all of our booths are selling weed. We give away a thousand free joints, um, that kind of thing. So... Yeah, every city has their own special event that, that is the biggest, and, and Golden Marijuana March is the biggest here in Toronto, but our 420 is still internationally known and recognized, and, and a very big and professional event, although not as big as Golden Marijuana March. Right, right. Cool, cool. So, uh, 420, booth space, maybe you can tell us uh, if someone's interested in, in having booth space at your event, uh, what are the costs? So we sell booths for four hundred twenty dollars, and uh, the table and power <laughs> and everything else. It, it just works out that way. We don't actually make anything. If I actually miss one one booth payment, I'm losing about four hundred bucks. So we basically just divide the amount they charge us by the amount of booths there are, and it comes up to a figure, and, and we add maybe fifty or hundred bucks, and that's it. It's uh, this this event is. is Truly, like done through through volunteers and sponsors, and and our city councilor supports the event, which actually waives our permit fee every year of four thousand dollars that that we should have to pay. But we also rent the square. There's a stage there, and um, with already speakers built in and stuff, and that costs eight thousand dollars to rent. So we pay that rental fee every year. But there's also a four thousand dollar permit fee, but we get waived it because we're a community event, a non profit community event. So but the vendors of course are all making money, but the event itself, uh, doesn't it, it's non for profit. It's all run by the hash mob and four twenty volunteers. So uh, we like it that way. No, that's awesome. That uh that's uh definitely makes for uh in my opinion a much more better and grassroots, obviously, event. Um, and uh, yeah, it's awesome to see uh, people still willing to volunteer and come out and help, especially on such a grand scale. Um, like you say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely large, uh, well-attended event. Um, and again, like you say, you're subject to, you know, it being on a Wednesday is a little bit tougher for some people. And of course, uh, being in the uh, being in the wonderful country of Canada, sometimes the weather can be a little uh, not so friendly to the event. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's just awesome, everything that's going on there. I know that in Ontario, you guys have uh, uh, probably, we're gonna, I'm going to rate you as the number two province behind British Columbia as far as being forward and you know, getting vapor lounge and getting things out and actually having things done. I mean, we're still in the dark ages here in Alberta. Um, there's no, we don't have any dispensaries in Calgary. We're a city of a million two, a million three. Um, uh, there's certainly no vapor lounges. There's absolutely nothing like that here. We're in the dark ages uh, compared to uh, Ontario and, and uh, British Columbia. Actually, I think every province, even uh, as I know, there is. Uh, I don't know if there still is. There at least was for a while a vapor lounge running in Regina, uh, and uh, Jeff, whom we had on the show before, uh, ran for a short period of time one in um, Saskatoon. So um, you know, these are you know Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, and Manitoba are like the you know the East Block as I call them. In terms of the cannabis industry, we're so far behind. It's it's insane. Um, yeah, not even really looking after the medical patient with dispensaries. Although there are a couple of uh, legitimate operations now that do offer services to help uh, connect uh, the cannabis patient with the cannabis producer. Um, we have that going for us, but nothing... Um, in terms of the social aspect, uh, I love the lounge uh, where you can go, you know, um, uh, I don't like to go to the bar and sit around and drink with my friends, but I love to go to the vapor lounge and sit around and vaporize with my friends. Uh, it's completely different. 
Um, uh, yeah, I can't wait for it to be like that all across the country. And I think a lot of alcohol establishments are going to change to cannabis establishments so they can get away from uh, a lot of the grief associated with uh, alcohol consumption. I agree. Yeah. A lot of the big lines of development recently have taken over old bars that have closed. So the, the bar and the bar stools are still there, but now it's a, a, a cannabis friendly environment. So that's nice to see that we're taking over some of the old alcohol and stuff. But, and most cities have like four or 5,000 liquor licenses for all these bars and restaurants. It's going to be nice to finally see that kind of number, or even if it's hundreds for cannabis licensed establishments. So eventually we'll get there. I agree, I agree, and I, I can't wait for the day. I know that uh, we're moving towards something uh, where the Liberal government is going to go. I don't know. Obviously, uh, I, I, I assume regardless of what path they choose, there will be some resistance and some elation, uh, depending on which side of the coin you're on. I'd be in the dollar coin, obviously, because, um, yeah, there's uh, a lot of new... Uh, businesses and new entrepreneurs and uh, um, yeah it's, it's going to be great for our country I think uh, we can uh, help show the world that uh, um, cannabis is uh, is accepted and I mean I've traveled I'm not super worldly traveled but I've traveled a lot of places and you know cannabis is friendly everywhere and it's the norm uh, for a lot of people and uh, you know, just finally getting on to it uh, this century. Um, yeah, I, I think Canada uh, can can lead in this industry and uh, lead by example, uh, being smart and uh, trying to do the right thing from beginning to end. And uh, I hope that that's the way it goes. And, you know, I, I, again, I think there's room for everybody in this industry, big and small. I'd love to see... Uh, uh, people be able to grow their own if they so desired. Uh, lots of people can't grow their own, so they should be able to buy it. They, In my opinion, they should be able to buy it from large producers or buy it from micro producers. We could call them <laughs> micro grows. And, uh, and then, of course, the big box companies. Uh, I think there's room for everybody in this industry. So um, hopefully it gets, uh, when they open it up, it is fairly open and, and, and it allows people an opportunity to become involved in the industry absolutely cool 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 so you're up and running can you uh tell us your address and contact information for this for the uh, lounge and and again we can let our listeners know that um it is a standard vapor lounge like anywhere else that you may have been in toronto or british columbia where you can go in and consume your own product, but you must bring your own product unless you are a, a licensed medical patient and then you are able to purchase one-time serving but not purchase to leave the store as like in a dispensary. That's right. So uh, Goodreads Lounge, we have all the social media for Goodreads Lounge. So there's goodreadslounge.com is our website. And then uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads Lounge. Um, so all three names there. And uh, uh, goodreadslounge at gmail.com is what we're using for our email currently. Uh, you can always email that and get a hold of me and my wife. Uh, it comes to both of us. Uh, for 420, we've always been using the hash mob moniker, but uh, you can always just get a hold of us through Goodreads Lounge. But there's uh, hash mob at gmail.com is the uh, for all 420 Toronto requests, like booths, vendors, sponsors, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it's easy to get a hold of us out there. Excellent. Yeah, that's right. 940 Danforth Avenue. 940 Dan Danforth? Yeah. Avenue, right? Danforth Avenue. Right. Gotcha. Is there an east or west designation there, or is it just 940 Danforth? No, Danforth on the east is like Bloor Street. So if it, if it was called anything else, it would be Bloor oh. Street East, but uh, it's not. It changes over to the Danforth, and uh, there is no east or west. Gotcha. That's for people like me that aren't from the area. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're easy to find. How, how large is the facility? How many uh, people are you allowed to have? Oh, the, the facility is huge. Like Vapor Central and Up and Slope in Hamilton were both 2,400 square feet. Uh, it just so happened that that was the size of the last two shops I've been running the last 15 years. But 
This place is 3,800 square feet. It's massive. It, it, it has, like, Paper Central and Up in Smoke had single washrooms. It, it, they both had two of them, but there's a toilet and a sink in one room. But this place actually has washrooms more like a mall or a, a restaurant where it, it's multiple stalls and multiple urinals, multiple sinks, and you're in a bigger room. We're just excited at the scope and size of this place. And it has a you know private uh, wheelchair accessible bathroom and office space and a stage and two beautiful bars and bar stools and leather couches. And so and we can easily accommodate two hundred plus. Um, I well, believe our fire code. I need to jump Sorry, in here. We are down at the end of the hour, so uh, we want to encourage everybody to do drop by and visit and vape, and we'll let you give uh, one more shout-out for your websites, and we'll start with our joint guest today, Chris. Yeah, GoodReadsLounge.com and all the social media at Goodreads Lounge. And Kelly? Um, for those of you that are looking for a, a free vaporizer and could, uh, could use one, uh, again, I want to reiterate it's free. We do also pay the shipping to get it to you. So super simple. Send me an email to kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdkwholesale.ca. And I want to remind people that we are a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week broadcasting network with an amazing team of people who are dedicated to ending prohibition. And I would encourage you to stop by timeforhemp.com and check out all the programming, it's also archived there. So if you find a program that you truly enjoy, whether it be Skunk Magazine on the air or Mark Emery or myself or Andrea Herman, Judge James Gray, and the list is long, all the programming that Time for Hemp produces is archived under the uh, shows that, under the host of the shows. So please make it a point to let your friends know there is free programming they can download and enjoy. Joy. And don't forget, Time for Hemp is like a good joint. It is always best when you share it with your friends. Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spend. Take another look and say some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper cause it hurts the environment. and information see what all the buzz is all about it's time for hemp it's time for hemp